Well, welcome everybody to the, the Quarry Restoration Landscape Biodiversity Talk by Andy Littler today. My name is Viv Russell. I'm the, the chair of the Institute of Quarrying. It gives me a great pleasure to introduce <coughs> Andy today. Andy is a, um, a long-term colleague and friend of mine who I've worked with for, for many years and worked against several times as well. And really, I'd, I'd really want to thank him very much for, for giving his time today for this uh, IQ presentation. Andy first got sort of fired up about biodiversity back in 1984 when he was working for ARC down at a uh, worker at Heath near Wareham. And he, he created a bird reservoir at the, uh, the Mock Beggar Lake. He then was actually um, involved back in the early 2000s when he was working for Tilcom. And uh, he, um, he claims, and I've got no doubt that it's, it's true, that he actually was introduced the first Quarries Biodiversity Action Plan at Mansetta and Balladon. And I'm sure he's got some examples of, of, of that and how, how they have developed over time. Along the way, he's also a trustee of uh, two county wildlife trusts at a uh, Somerset and Dorset. And uh, he's also a, val a volunteer for the Dorset Wildlife Trust and, uh, and has been an advocate for biodiversity all, all his career. So I'd really like to hand over to Andy now. Thank you very much uh, for doing the presentation for us today, Andy. So just to um, you know, complete the, the introduction, I think it's always worth saying, uh, what, what, what are you trying to achieve in any meeting, any event, any, any, any webinar? And what I'm trying to achieve is obviously to inform and educate, to get people their CPD hour, uh, but also to raise the profile of this subject, biodiversity, uh, during and after quarrying. And hopefully uh, to inspire people to, to get more involved in it, those that you know, aren't or are at, at the periphery. So here we go. Let's, uh, let's start with some definitions. Restoration the process of giving quarried land a useful purpose after quarrying, agriculture, forestry, recreation, housing, other development, or to a nature reserve natural habitat. And the point here is that in all the cases, biodiversity could be increased. Uh, if, um, if land is good agricultural land, it probably ought to be restored as such, opportunities for brownfield development, recreation, etc. It doesn't preclude some aspect of biodiversity. And the biodiversity definition is simply the variety of plant and animal species living in their natural environment. Huge loss of biodiversity in the UK since World War II and indeed since the 70s. You've probably heard some of the figures, but hay meadows, 95% I think have gone since World War I. Ponds, farmland birds, insects, they're hugely declining. And I think this industry can do something, uh, our own part to address that. Can the quarrying industry promote more biodiversity? Well, I think it can. Um, have we got the resources? Have we got the intent? Have we got the skills? Have we got the drive? We've certainly got the resources. I mean, if we spend uh, one and a half percent of our ex-work stone revenue on restoration, I did a little sum, that's about 20 million pounds a year. That's a, that's a lot of cash. Uh, there are about over a thousand mineral sites in the UK, maybe 140 square miles over under quarry control. That's an awful lot compared to, you know, the wildlife trusts or the RSPB organizations like that. And let's remind ourselves of the past, over 60% of sites of special scientific interest are at least in part old mineral working. So we're not necessarily starting something new here. It's been going on for a long time. The intent, I'm not gonna read, read out all these grand words, but if you go on the sites of the big companies, uh, you will see they're all committed to this. Um, CEMEX, high quality restoration of mineral sites offers an effective way to develop areas for wildlife and recreating a range of habitats. So if you're a, um, a humble quarry manager out there, be assured that the powers that be, uh, you know, want this thing to be successful. Why do mineral sites have such potential for increasing biodiversity? This is, you know, straightforward question really that wants uh, answering. Let's have a look. Well, they're often distinct geology, acid or alkaline, 
and that gives unique habitats, heaths, calcareous, grassland, etc. The topography is often uneven. That gives cliffs for nesting, scree slopes for specialist plants, damp depressions. The, th the, th the soils are often thin, nutrient poor, or historically absent, uh, i.e. someone sold them years ago in, uh, in many cases. That's actually a good thing, and we'll see this. It allows flowers to prosper at the expenses of, of grasses and ruderal plants. We get wet and dry areas that suits different flora and fauna. The rotations are often remote and not subject to uh, human interference. And then we've got the sort of non-physical factors. These sites are, uh, are subject to planning conditions, to biodiversity action plans, cash is available from the operator. And, um, you know, there is a real uh, drive from those factors to enhance biodiversity potential. Let's start with some, uh, some nice pictures. This is the home the Hoag Range Nature Quarry Reserve in, uh, in Derbyshire. Uh, you can see the parties involved here, Longcliffe, Derbyshire Wildlife Trust, Butterfly Conservation. And this was a quarry that was abandoned many years ago, as there are hundreds up and down the country. So what can we do with something that's just been abandoned and left in that nature? Do, do, we, do, we, do we leave it or, or, or do we improve it? Well, for a start, we manage it. And that's a theme I'm going to be returning to. So that Derbyshire Wildlife Trust, people who you know, know what they're doing in, in, in terms of, uh, of encouraging the biodiversity, the habitat advisors on the butterflies, they all help. And then the people to fund it, in this case, Longcliffe Quarries, who, who very generously uh, uh, pay out everything. Hoag Grange doesn't, doesn't look much. Um, but you can see a lot of the features there we, uh, we talked about. Uh, bare rock, topography, uh, changes, um, uh, changes in aspect, uh, wet areas you can't see, dry areas. Uh, these, these, these are good for, in this case, calcareous grassland because, and, and, and for basking insects and reptiles, etc. Because that bare ground, that paucity of soil, means you don't get these uh, thick invasive grasses and ruderal plants, that's docks and thistles and, and uh, hogweed, etc. But it can be improved, and, and is being improved and continues to, to be so. This is the kind of thing you get from the bare, bare ground. This is calcareous grassland. Good calcareous grassland has 20 to 30 species per quadrat. A quadrat is two square meters, standard sort of thing ecologists use. And you can see there all the flowers that are associated with it, ladies' bed, bed straw, wild marjoram, air bells, uh, thyme on the bare ground on the right, bird's foot trefoil, a, a, a legume, and these are all thriving at, uh, at Hoag Range. They thrive and the insects that live on them uh, thrive. And in particular, this uh, reserve is associated with very high numbers, uh, both in scope and in numbers itself of, of butterflies. And the fellow in the top right, the wall, is a specialist in basking on bare areas and therefore likes Ho Grange and is a, is a real hot spot for it. Wall numbers have declined 80% over the last 40 years. That's a staggering figure, 80%. So we need places like uh, Ho Grange for it to, uh, to prosper. Can we improve these reserves? Yes, we can. This is a dew pond, which was completely um, uh, full of, of silt and it was just growing willows and it's been restored using the uh, cash of the owners to um, a habitat for, for newts, for frogs, for dragonflies and for birds to bathe in. And it's been done properly uh, with a traditional clay liner. In the background, you can see the uh, Peak Park District uh, 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 National Park. And this is a, a real enhancement of it. Generally speaking, adding some water in these situations is usually a positive thing. So how do we go about internally making some more little improvement? Safety, always on the agenda. So we have to put up uh, uh, banks to 
stop people uh, falling over uh, over cliffs. But let's do it in, in, in a proper proper manner. So you, you, you build them out of quarry waste. Uh, and then in this case, you top them off with uh, waste dust because it retains uh, moisture. And then you use uh, a special calcareous grassland wildflower seed mix spread over the top of it. And that is 12 months later. That's all those plants we're targeting done as simply as that. You can see the sign warning on the left, but it isn't an ugly pile of pop stones. It's been done right. Hoe Grange is somewhere where species are sort of quite actively targeted because of this interest in, 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 in butterflies and recording has been going on there for 20 years. If you record butterflies year in, year out, you can see the how numbers increase, how the numbers of species increase. And in this case, we've got that number up in three or four years to from 21 to 25. Now, bearing in mind, uh, it's 26 today after the white letter hair streak uh, appeared. Bearing in mind there's only 49 in the whole of the UK, that's about half the species that you can see at Hoe Grange, which is a fantastic result. How do you do that? This might sound a little bit interventionist, but all butterflies have a larval food, food, food plant. The, the white letter hair streak is elm, there were some elm on the site, we planted some more. The brimstone, it's, the, uh, it's, it's, it's buckthorns, we planted some of those. And uh, I'll leave you to guess which is the larval food plant of the holly blue. Here's an open day at uh, uh, Hoe Grave back in July 2017. 250 visitors. Uh, I think the one that followed it got a whole lot more. Hugely successful. Very, very positive um, article on that uh, evening news, uh, East Midlands Today, uh, praising the efforts. And just what's not to, uh, what's not to like. It's, it does the industry a power of good, things like this. And... Uh, Last but not least, if you give away ice cream and beer, then uh, you're not going to fail, are you? Just to remind us, this isn't a quarry, it's an agricultural grass field. I'm not anti-farming, we've got to eat. But this is a desert for biodiversity. There's a single species of plant. It's not attractive to pollinators. It's not attractive to the creatures that prey on pollen pollinators. Just keep this field in mind as we go through a few more slides. We're going on to Mansetta uh, Quarry now. I know we've got uh, the manager at the time, Mark Hardy, uh, listening in. And this was uh, back in his day in 2001. This is the Albury Quarry. It's very interesting geologically. It's, uh, it's a diorite uh, sill uh, dipping between uh, baked contact uh, rocks in, in shale. And what that gives you is the the shale has got a lot of pyrite in it. Uh, the pyrite, as soon as it comes in contact with air and water, it makes sulfuric acid, and it's incredibly acidic. The uh, the soil and the uh, and the the, the the top rock sort of spoil. So remember that picture. That's it. Twenty years on. This is this is one of the biodiversity action plans that uh, Viv uh, referred to started back in 2000, 2002. And this is it today with a fisheye lens. Now, because there is so much uh, overburden and some interburden at Mansetta, you're stripping off enormous amounts of, uh, of, of, of waste material. And you can see these piled up on the right and on the, uh, and on the left, ready to be folded back into the quarry. And this is sort of all about planning, but what this is giving you is a huge area which potentially was agriculture, was fields, and which can be set back into rolling countryside, attractive rolling countryside, but with a high biodiversity content. If we look closely, I put one in just for the quarry managers who are starting to get bored already. Uh, this is the, uh, the rock. Uh, at the bottom, this is the diorite, skid resistant, 62 PSD, dug out, as is the way these days, by an excavator standing on the shop. And you can see some buffer blasting 
uh, going on in the uh, bottom left corner. But this is an unusual quarry in the UK to have that much overburden, and it's because it's in a very densely populated um, area with a with, with a valuable high uh, skid resistant stone. So what do we do at Mansetta? Well, we started with a uh, tip called the Jubilee uh, tip, I don't know which Jubilee it was. Um, and in 2004, planted, in this case, a mix of flowers and grasses suitable for acidic uh, ground. Th this ground really is acidic. It's uh, 3.5, uh, some of the, the water in some of the uh, pools. Sort of, you wouldn't think anything would grow on it, but, but, it, but it does. And you can see in front of you, the flowers that came up within four years, the, the oxide daisies, the birdfoot trefoil, et cetera, et cetera, and the lack of um, grasses in there. And skylarks were already nesting on this four year restored area. So, you know, we've gone from a, a pile of waste uh, to this smoothed out into, in, into good contours. And we see some of the specialist um, flowers involved, the uh, common century, on the left, the ragged robin on the on the right, which are indicative of of acidic uh, acidic ground. This is going to become a story of management, and I refer to management a few times. These are those same fields uh, I was showing you in 2013. The hedges are growing up, the wildflower meadows still there, trees are growing up, quarries in the background. It's all looking fine and dandy. And the idea here is there are a number of small fields separated by hedgerows, both good habitats, things to fly in and out of and hide in. Good situation. That's a, that's a close up. Just wanted to put that in because it's one of my favorite flowers. That's Viper's, Viper's Bugloss, which incidentally does well in the alkaline conditions as well, just to be confusing. but. Uh, it's, uh, it's there and you've got common mallow, but looking good in 2013. Oh dear, what's happened in 2019? Well, sadly it hasn't been managed uh, and the grasses are taking over. You're seeing bramble coming in, the hedgerows overgrown, that's itself not a bad thing really, but the, the meadow is being lost. And why is it being lost? It's being lost because it's not being grazed or it's not being cut once a year, very late in the season, and that material removed to keep it uh, nutrient poor. Now, the owners of, uh, uh, of this, this quarry are, are going to put this right. Um, they're, 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 they're very concerned about it and it will be done right. And it, it, I would have a slide to show it in better condition if it hadn't been for, uh, for COVID. But there's a, a real theme here that you have to manage biodiversity just the same as you could have managed anything else really. This was uh, interesting uh, in the 2001 uh, BAP we tried to recreate heathland. There's almost no heathland left in Warwickshire. There's an awful lot in Shakespeare's day and we devised a plan to put dif different heathland uh, uh, treatments on, on, on different um, substrates of weathered shale or just quarry waste. I won't go into exactly how that works, but the point is there was a plan. And here's it being executed. We took uh, heather brashings from one of the uh, small areas of, of Heathland in Warwickshire. We spread it all around um, on these different substrates and just let it go. That's it. But you use heather brash rather than seed because you also get a whole load of other heathland uh, flora in there. And also it acts as a, it generates a microclimate by having that brash covering the ground. It, it retains moisture and it retains uh, warmth uh, to, to, to an extent. And that's been proven to, to work. Did it work? Yeah, it did. So there we are, 10 years on. Heather is growing on a most unpromising looking substrate of, 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 of weathered top rock. There's no soil in there at all. There's no fertilizer, just to be clear. And that's Heather early in the season. It'll be purple in, in three months time. That's a close up. 
uh, and that line is one of the trial lines, that blue line. Beyond is the sort of weathered substrate, quite fine, somewhat moisture retentive. In the foreground, just the quarry scalpings. And you wouldn't think it made a difference, but you can see it does. That weathered substrate is growing material a lot better than when no restoration uh, covers applied. So, you know, I keep saying it's got to be nutrient poor, but it does have to be moisture retentive to, to, an, ex, to an extent. You can see heather is growing in the, in the first uh, part. And you'll see here the uh, birch, uh, which is a very invasive species uh, coming in. Good in its own right, um, but uh, beginning to invade the, uh, the heathland trials. And that, again, needs managing um, because that will, that will just, just take over in due course. It hasn't yet. The situation is utterly recoverable, but that, that birch needs, needs managing. Again, heathland specialists are coming in, wavy hair grass on the uh, left and heath speedwell on the, uh, on, on, on the right. So, you know, we've got a success on our hands. And if you think about it as a quarry company, if you could start with ordinary agricultural land and you actually convert it to what is a really rare habitat in the county you're operating, you're going to score all sorts of points by doing that, aren't you? This was a, a, another point in Mansetta. Again, this is 2019 after spreading wildflower mix on, on, on scalpings. Very, very uh, low density of, um, of vegetation on there, but native you know, wildflowers. And a lot of our colleges think this is, uh, this is the way to do it. They, they don't want things really green. They, they, want, they want the plants to struggle because then they'll get the native uh, rare plants with all their associated uh, insects and the food chain goes goes up. So it just shows you how long it takes. If there's any planners watching and they want the green in three years time, they're gonna have to wait in some cases to get a really biodiverse result. We looked at that bowl shaped quarry um, earlier on and uh, that was on the other side of the road at Mansetta. This is the finish of the one to the north and you can see what a beautiful bowl shaped uh, restoration feature that is. That's all worked, that's all worked out quarry with the lakes in the bottom, uh, sitting in these sort of patches of, of woodland and small agricultural fields. That now needs dividing up, uh, it needs some heathland creating, it needs some hedgerows, it needs some, some fields, but you can see great potential there for a, a really good result. This is uh, the, the quarry manager I was referring to, Mike Hardy's uh, pond, built in 20, uh, 2002 and lined with clay from Wilmot Oak Brick. Excellent example of a, a fully natural pond, no liner. 2013, wildlife haven, brilliant. You know, dancing with dragonflies, lovely place to have a picnic or something. Here we've got the management issue again. 2019, the pond's almost completely overgrown. That's a goat willow in the foreground. Again, easy to remedy. You just need to take the goat willow out, which is sucking all the moisture out of it, and perhaps do some uh, clearance with, a, with an excavator. Again, will be addressed. There's a nice little one to end on at Mansetta. On the right is... Um, uh, seeds from the wild service tree, quite rare. Uh, the consultant ecologist David Broom found one tree on the edge of the quarry, raised dozens and dozens of seedlings from it and got local school children to, uh, to plant them there. And in uh, years to come, Mansetta Quarry will be associated with an awful lot of wild service trees. Let's move down to uh, Dorset then, um, away from hard rock quarries and to um, to a sand pit. This is uh, Wargrit Heath, uh, Wareham in, uh, in, in Dorset. Worked out pit at its lateral planning limits. Sand pit, fine sand, silver and clay at the base. Looks ugly. So this is the restoration in process. Survey it, calculate the volumes, take those materials from the uh, base and push them up the sides and you know, get some sort of feature that looks more geomorphologically, more landform. Uh, you know, uh, friendly, not just looking like a disused quarry. You then do the spreading of the heather brashings, and you can see in this uh, picture 
that we've got Heather, we, we've got some undulating topography deliberately. Those are those little uh, rills, those uh, those those depressions, those trenches, call them what you like. They will gather water more than the other things. And with, with heather in, in in wet areas, you, you you get a heather called Erica tetralix, and in dry area you get um, uh, cinerea, the or common ling. So again, you know, you're varying the thing. And in the background, we have the, uh, some bare slopes have been left for mason bees and for San Martins to nest in, et cetera, et cetera. So it's planned, it's planned with nature in mind. Heathland in Dorset it is a really big deal. The, 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 uh, you know, an awful lot was lost since Hardy's Egdon Heath and any attempts to put it back find uh, real favor. Again, returning to this theme of uh, the nutrient thin soils. On the left, that's after 15 years, looks pretty good, but you're starting to see uh, pines coming in. On the right, it's taken a full 30 years, but it's pretty much pure heather. And the reptiles and insects love that bare ground for, 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 for basking, so not necessarily a bad thing, but both good examples. If you want to uh, relocate heather properly, or indeed any soil or turf properly, if, if, if you've got a field that's very biodiverse, it, it, it's a good representative of, um, uh, of, uh, of, of, of ancient grassland, you can lift the thing up in turfs. And this has been done by a, a company called uh, Alaska Contracting. Specialist machine, specialist contractor, but eminently doable. And, uh, instant results and it, and it and it works big big turfs 2.4 by 1.2 onto those little trucks in a way and, and replaced alternatively you can do nothing and you still get some sort of result this is a this is an old one of heathland you can see vegetation is is, is coming back the sun martins and the and the beans are, are using it this is natural regeneration if you can afford the time you know, it, 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 it does work, but it, but it helps to give it a, a helping hand, I think. And why, why are people so keen on Heathland? Well, because of the denizens, really. Uh, there you've got the grayling, uh, top left, the smooth snake. Um, uh, on the uh, left bottom, the uh, nightjar, a crepuscular um, bird around at uh, dawn and dusk uses the heather and the Dartford warbler um, down on the uh, uh, right bottom, a bird that declined to sort of dozens at one point in the 80s after a severe winter and has come back up. And just finishing off on that is quite an amusing slide I found back in the 80s when I was working on this, these Heathland restorations, we found that if you made long sinuous uh, little banks, uh, east-west trending, so the outer south side, that the sand lizards would bask on them. Uh, and this, this has been done ever since on, on this sort of uh, re restoration. Spooling forward to 2019, I happened to be there visiting the Higher Hyde Heath Nature Reserve uh, next to it, while they were building some of these banks. Unfortunately, they, the sort of the note got lost a bit along the way because these are very geometric. They're east-west, but you know they look like a someone's going to be buried under a, 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 under part of the so the art's gone out of it a little bit. But nevertheless, they're east-west banks and they're doing it. And don't you just love nature? If you go a hundred meters away, the sun lizards are basking on a pile of old roof tiles. <laughs> They, they love it, you know, it's, uh, it's sunny, they warm up, uh, they've, uh, they, 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 they've adapted. Quite, quite a spectacular looking animal, the, the, the sun lizard, that bright green of the, of the male. So let's go to, up to Ballard and Quarry. Um, this is 2019. Uh, if you don't want people to um, uh, look at your quarry development, don't leave a, uh, a big picture in the hall because uh, people come along with an iPhone and take a snap of it. And that's uh, Ballard in 2019. We, um, we started this biodiversity action plan again back in, back in 2000. 
Ballard and Quarry is actually in the Peak District National Park and they are the uh, planning authority. I think it's an interesting slide. On the left is the Peak District National Park. Uh, again, a, a triple SI, calcareous grassland in this case. On the right is an old tip from Ballard and Quarry. Now, some people would struggle to tell the difference, partly because sheep have been grazing on the old tip and are starting to make uh, tracks up and, up, up and down it. And it's, again, it's a very thin, poor soil. It's just developed from the quarry waste. So a bit of a model of what can be done at Balladon. I could do an hour on biodiversity action plans and it'd be terribly boring. Um, but broadly speaking, to make a biodiversity action plan, what you do is you take the plan for your county or your planning authority, in this case, the, the big bar, and you look at the habitats they've identified, the habitats they're trying to encourage and incorporate those into your plan. It's sort of as simple as that. In this case, the some ones clearly would benefit if the quarry got involved. Calcareous grassland, damp areas, ash woods, and hay meadow creation. There are others as well. And you compartmentalize the whole quarry, adapt the restoration plan to target these habitats. This is us going about it. It's a very old picture, but quarry companies have got, uh, have got money. At least they've got enough to plant trees from baskets. <laughs> um, I mean, that exercise cost about uh, 300 pounds for the trees and 3,000 for the crane probably, but I'm exaggerating, but it, it's quite an extreme thing to do to be uh, planting trees from a basket. And I think it shows the commitment of the industry. On the left, we're constructing uh, banks on the quarry benches. And if you just leave a quarry bench you know, seven meters wide as bare rock, not much is gonna happen for many, many years. But if you throw waste material, large waste material up towards the uh, face and then put a very thin cover of uh, soil or scalpings or something like that on top, you will um, soften the look of the quarry and create some rootable material. You then need to plant it with trees. If you don't, you disappear from that bench and it will just scrub over with native with, with sycamore or something like that. Uh, you won't get, you know, a, a sort of a semi-natural woodland. So think of those uh, pictures and we'll, uh, we'll move on to um, 2013. Uh, the trees on the left-hand side have, have grown successfully. The rollover looks nice and green. It's been grazed by sheep. And you then look to the right-hand picture, and by 2019, we're now depositing waste and pushing it up against that, that, that slope. So the whole intention is that if you are looking at this, and there are lots of walking trails around, you would see the quarry rolling over from the landscape into the quarry, and then you would see a series of broken up benches, which are green because they're planted with trees. So grazing regime on the rollover, tree planting on the benches, and you're making something that looks something like the local dale side. This is uh, past my day, and uh, the management here is uh, is doing a great job because they've um, they've uh, smoothed out, but not too smoothed out, an area in another part of the of the quarry, and uh, planted it um, either with um, uh, sort of calcareous gra with 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 with, 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 with uh, grasses and and plants, or with some woodland there. So that's twenty thirteen. And you can see the, the, the quality of the scalpings. There's no soil on that, none at all. It's just the sort of minus 40 millimeter you take off as the first stage in uh, quarrying. 2019, six years on, that's the same picture from the same angle and it's greened up beautifully and the trees are growing well. Uh, I think the trees are growing in unpacked, uncompacted ground, uh, that's good. Uh, and, and the thing is, uh, is greening up and not greening up uh, too, too fast. And in the background, we've got some of the other, other habitats, the scree, 
slopes and the rock faces that the peregrines uh, uh, nest on, et cetera, et cetera. And that's sort of done well six years on because they've used a, a process called green mulch in this case, because there's absolutely no soil there at all. They planted, uh, they've sown things which are, are legumes, they're clovers, bird's foot trefoils, etc. They're nitrogen fixing. And these will gradually form a very thin uh, soil. And from there, you'll move on to the cal calcareous grassland. But this is to give the thing a starter. You can do it one of two ways. You can wait and get the calcareous grassland, or you can do this first, build up a bit of nutrients, uh, a bit of soil, uh, and then it will, it will come, come faster. There's, there is, as, if you get a, a load of ecologists in the room, if there's nine of them, you'll have nine views. They are you know, um, interesting people like that. This is, uh, we were talking about uh, rollovers. This is Ballard, and again, I, I like this picture. I'm, I'm sort of a little bit proud of this picture, really, because I think that is close to a Daleside uh, view. That, that, that's a quarry. But if you'd imagine if that was top to bottom as a rock face, it wouldn't look natural. I think it looks pretty natural. Uh, you know, at the top, you've got the scree slopes, you've got some uh, bare faces have been uh, left. Uh, on, on, the, on the right, similarly, where it runs into some uh, soft dolomite uh, rock. And then on the uh, benches, you'll, you'll see that the, the spoil has been, been put on there and they're, they're beginning to grass up. Unfortunately, when we went six years later, it was a very misty day. Incidentally, that foreground there you're seeing with the, with the lumps of rock. Uh, when I was there in 2000, uh, that was a quarry. There's a hundred meters of spoil under there. They, 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 they have to reject a lot of material at Balladon because it's an industrial limestone uh, quarry. So that's it in the fog uh, in 2019. You're getting a few more trees, a bit more development on the benches, and that will, that will continue. Um, and, you know, the, the planners in Peak Park see this as an exemplar example they, they published in their magazine articles about ballad and they they, they they think the industry has done a really good job here i'll leave people to read that really at their will maybe later but this is this is talking about the difference between a rollover and a bench which i, I sort of alluded to earlier but this rolling over from the landscape down into the quarry and then the uh, restoring the uh, the benches themselves the, the bench is a process somewhat complicated now by uh, the need to put rock traps in, but you can still do it. You just need to cover the rock traps with suitable root and rootable material and uh, you know, make, make sure there's something there for the trees to get into and plant the trees while it's, while it's safe. Don't forget to avoid over compaction and waterlogging of the grounds. It's, um, uh, and, and to use some sort of moisture retenting uh, material. This is a little trial in the same area, just shows you graphically, this was done in 2001. On that bench, you have 100% soil, you've got no soil, you've got 75% scalpings, 25% soil. And I would argue the 25% soil, 75 scalpings is probably the way to go. And it just shows you, you don't need a lot of your valuable topsoil to make the thing, uh, make the thing work. I pointed out a couple of cock up to date. This is one of mine. Uh, I, I specified to the forester that he, uh, he planted some buckthorn. I wanted to attract the brimstone. He, he attracted, uh, he, he planted sea buckthorn. I think we're about 100 miles from the coast here. <laughs> There's uh, just a, another example of uh, rollovers and bench restorations. That's Dean Quarry down near, uh, down, down near Cromford. You know, quite a nice job maturing, uh, maturing well there. In this case, the slopes in the middle and on the left are, have been made with excess rock dust. Again, what we're trying to achieve is, is, is make it look something like the Dale side. This is another example. This is a long cliff quarry, last place I worked. And what I'm trying to show here is, is, is a genesis, really, a, you know, a timeline. On the right, that uh, face you can see in the distance with this fisheye lens, there's some tree and shrub planting on narrow benches, not much, a bunch of toothbrushes really, but it's, it's working, it's coming. 
you know, time will do it. In the middle between 2014 and 17, we've made those benches irregular and we put more routable material on them and they will green up uh, far faster. And then on the left, we've got the full hog where we've got a rollover coming in from the peak part, which will be grazed. And then the next slopes down are, you know, properly, properly treated. In fact, they, they just scrape faces with clay soil back banged into them. I think you can see that if you took time to study that, if that whole thing looked like it did on the left, it would look a lot more natural. On the right, there's a, an arrow pointing down to the um, uh, flowers we've got there. That is just a calcareous grassland mix, 80% uh, grasses, 20% welfare. Look at it, that's two years on. It's a fantastic meadow. It's a, it's a, it's a thing of beauty. And the uh, 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 Viv Russell introduced us as, uh, has built a splendid viewing platform uh, just above that. Going back to Balladon, we'll talk about uh, hay meadows uh, for, a, uh, for, for a couple of minutes. In this case, uh, an agricultural uh, field which has been restored on, on top of an old uh, uh, waste spines pile. We've stripped off the soil, um, stripped off the, the, the soil. The soil was too nutrient rich, so we, we've taken it off and mixed it with scalpings for things elsewhere in the, in the quarry. We've then ripped it to get uh, uh, drainage, uh, chain harrow and seeded it with the same sort of mixes I've been talking about. So this is very positive intervention to make hay meadow, which is so uncommon. And there we are in 2013, absolute rip roaring success. It's a beautiful uh, hay meadow, frankly, the, the, the blue flowers in the foreground are um, a meadow cranes built, yeah, and the purple ones are um, knapweed. We go on, six years to uh, the, the, the foggy day, and it's still in very good order. Um, and you see uh, just above the text there, those yellows that are rather bubbly flowers, um, they're hay rattle. Hay rattle is parasitic on grass, uh, and therefore uh, it tends to thin it out and encourages the, uh, the, the, the wildflowers, an essential component, really, in any, uh, any hay meadow. This it's doing really well, it might do even better. I'm not sure there's that formal a system of, um, of managing it. it. It just needs cutting and the cutting's taking away the hay once a year, about August, when everything's uh, finished, uh, finished flowering. I'm going to talk, talk about woodlands for a minute and particularly enhancing woodlands. It's one thing to, uh, to plant and grow a wood. Once you've done it, it needs thinning out and an understory put again. You put in an understory of, uh, of, of, of native uh, species, holly, hazel, hawthorn, blackthorn, etc., like that, and you've got a far more interesting uh, biodiverse uh, wood. And uh, leave the piles of, uh, of brash to rot down and, uh, and allow insects to bore in which incidentally uh, didn't happen on this, <laughs> on this next slide, it was, again, a, one of my errors, you, you really shouldn't turn all the brashings into, uh, in, 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 into pulp. It's better to leave them there, but it's another uh, thinning out. And I keep talking about native trees, okay? Planting native trees. Let's just nail that one down. Why, why, why? In that table, you can, you can see it. Oak, associated insect species, 284. 423 if you count flies. 284 species. Go down to the bottom, rhododendron, nor. Um, that's why you do it. You know, oak, birch, blackthorn, crab, apple, alder, all these things that have been in England, in the UK for, you know, since the Ice Age, have got their associated insects and bryophytes and fungi, whereas imported, uh, you know, trees don't have. So that's where you plant native trees. So at Balladon, the resultant flora gives us a whole pile of uh, insects that feed off the, uh, off the flora. And then you get the birds, these pictures taken by local enthusiasts at the time. Again, emphasizing why we're doing this, the linnet, um, uh, uh, local BAP species uh, in the Peak Park, declined 60% since 1970, that's 60% since 1970, the wheat here, 50 percent 
This is serious stuff. It's one of the world's you know, problems along with overpopulation and, uh, and climate change. And we can do something to address it. We can do a lot to address it, to be honest. Little trip out uh, back to uh, Longcliffe Quarries. This is um, uh, wetland. Uh, there's not too much wetland in this presentation, and there are some fantastic examples of wetland by the quarrying industry, needing with tarmac over in the uh, Fens in Cambridgeshire and tarmac's uh, Langford um, uh, Lakes in Nottinghamshire. There's some some huge projects that uh, uh, Attenborough, which was donated by Semex the other day, uh, just uh, south of south of Nottingham. Anyway, this is a small one, but a, a really nice little wetland because it's wet and it's also got the reeds and, uh, and the wet areas which, which just wet plants that, you know, survive in. And um, that uh, area was chosen to uh, be a donor site for great crested newts. Uh, these are some uh, more uh, lakes that we created adjacent. The, the trick is when you're putting a lake or a pond or something like that is to have lots of shallows. You don't want steep slopes into the thing. That's not good. If you have shallows, you get reed beds that protects the, uh, the, the edge itself, encourages you know, nesting birds, ducks, bitterns, et cetera, et cetera, and all the aquatic life that goes with it, you know, the reptiles, the newts, the frogs. And uh, this, is, this is a year on. So again, really successful and the news have been translocated into there. Thought I'd stick an amusing picture in there. Um, an old colleague of mine used to have this sort of in front of him because uh, that's two very rare species interacting. Uh, problem is one's eating the other. Uh, so that's the, that's, that, that's the bitten, uh, the booming bitten. Great success story coming back to a lot of RSPB reserves in East Anglia, eating a great crested new. I mean, for quarry man at a great crested newt, he'd be in jail the following week, but it's all right for the bins. So I thought I'd uh, put that in. So let's summarize the uh, key points. Quarries represent excellent opportunities for enhancing biodiversity. High quality biodiversity enhancement on current workings may insist the grant of permissions. The two things that can shut you down in quarrying, apart from the market, are, 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 are safety and planning. And uh, this can contribute to your planning success, I can assure you. Forward planning significantly reduces the cost of quarry restoration. And just simple steps like planting native grasses and wildflower seeds, and native trees and shrubs works. I'll give you an example. We, 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 we were restoring a, a field bunch of fields in KB in Leicestershire and they're about to put the hedgerows back in as per planning all in Hawthorne and just by adding 20% of a whole load of other species we got a much more attractive hedgerow and if you think about it the cost of putting a hedgerow in you've got to put lines of uh, barbed wire either side you've got to plant them you, you, you've got to disturb the ground first it, it, it's a tiny percentage to do it right and get a mix of species in there be innovative, conduct trials, involve the local community, target habitat, species, or both, and you're going to need some specialist advice on that. Remember, wildlife likes variety, slope, dampness, soil type, aspect, allow some natural regeneration. And it's rewarding and it's fun. It's, uh, you know, not everything you know, we do on a day-to-day -day basis is as nice as going out in the sunshine and seeing how your restoration is, is progressing. Returning to the start, we put the definitions in, we decided we got the resources and the intent, we got the skills and we got the drive. I'm not certain, to be honest. Uh, the drive, the drive for excellence in quarry restoration, I think it's patchy, really. The drive for safety and lean manufacturing is much higher. Environmental management, to my mind, is often focused on legal compliance and is something of a box ticking exercise. And monitoring by local authorities. Again, this is my experience. It's got to be I'm the guy presenting it. Other people have different experiences. I found that very variable. Uh, the planners are all over you like a rash when you're making an application. You don't see an awful lot of them in later years, I, I've often found. But let's put the pluses in. There's some pockets of excellent practice on some on a huge scale. And we, we've got to applaud that. There is a lot of excellence. 
There's a long running history of industry, of industry competitions and awards. And we're now getting third party monitoring by many large companies. The skills, well, this is an important slide to me, really. I think, you know, to make this thing work, you have got to have a combination of motivated people on the ground, the quarry managers, the supervisors, could be individuals in the quarry, frankly, if they're interested in the subject. And, and that often works. And some specialist knowledge provided centrally, ecologists, landscape architects, etc. Again, I think this is done better at planning stage than it is as it's been managed over the, over the years. I would argue that quarry managers generally lack the knowledge, experience or training, though some develop an interest and are invaluable. And then we look at our industry courses. University Derby Foundation courses, I'm told, have got some quarry restoration uh, content. I've, I've certainly given them all this stuff. Note that MP Skills offers 37 training courses, none of which cover any aspect of biodiversity, no less than cover 24, cover health and safety. I'm not saying we shouldn't have 12, 24 health and safety courses, just be having nice to have one on landscape and, and biodiversity. So the industry needs to ensure there are sufficient specialists to include restoration and biodiversity in environmental training, in my view. The prize, good restoration and biodiversity will give you support for further planning applications, benefit the local community, promotes the ethics of the business, not necessarily expensive if planned, and altruism is the right thing to do. The stick, biodiversity action plans must be followed, they'll be monitored by the MPA and English Nature, approved restoration schemes are going to be adhered to, and coming down the track are planning applications will need to show a net biodiversity gain of 10%. That's going to be mandatory. So that's one that's, uh, that's coming in, has come in now, really. This is, um, this is a field, again, at, at Longcliffe. It was um, just covered in thistles. It was sort of just badly grazed. It was an area which we were going to be working from an adjacent quarry over the next 20 years. And we thought, let's do something with this a bit more exciting. So it was um, harrowed, sprayed off, and uh, a wildflower mix uh, planted, which is very heavy in poppies because we were coming up to the 100th anniversary of the uh, armistice in 20, uh, uh, 2019. And it looks fantastic. That's a particularly good photograph, but this is a, a big area and it cost under 10,000 pounds. That's all. Many thanks to Tarmac, Longcliffe Quarries, Hanson, Alaska Contracting, David Broom, consultant ecologist, and two photographers, uh, Nigel Weeden and, Gaz, Weeden and Gaz Slack. That's my email address there. I do this stuff on a not-for-profit basis. If anyone wants advice, I'll, I'll give it free if they want me to come and give a talk. I just want my expenses. And uh, please go out and use this information wisely. Thank you very much. That was brilliant, Andy. As you can imagine, we've had quite a few questions and points that have been kind of raised in the chat function while you've been speaking. While I go through those, I'm also going to throw a question that we had submitted via email prior to the, the webinar starting. And that question was from Trevor Poole, who said, do you think making use of nature over a longer period for quarry restoration can result in lower carbon emissions as compared to trying to force things along to achieve planning goals for a faster but maybe lower quality restoration in the longer term? Yes, yeah, quite, quite a difficult question in a way. Of course, um, if you don't force things along, you won't use nitrate fertilizer. So that's a, that's a, that's a plus. Um, but these aren't huge areas. But uh, so yes, from that point of view, I wouldn't force it along. Obviously, the, um, the carbon sequestration can be a lot about tree planting. So if you've got a lot of tree cover, that's going to, uh, that, that, that's going to help things along as well. But uh, I, to answer the question, I wouldn't have thought it made a vast amount of difference. But I think the uh, nature conservation is, is probably the positive end of it. Brilliant. Okay, so going through the chat function, we had an early question from Mark Smedley, who wondered what your views were about the intent to increase biodiversity being shared by smaller operators as well as big operators, um, and how do we promote 
that aspect in the industry? I think some of the smaller operators do, do a great job. I mean, I, you know, I know people like, uh, you know, Collymore's and, you know, Hills, uh, you know, around, around Swindon and, and Gloucestershire have got a proud record of doing, you know, these things. My last company, Longcliffe's comparatively small. Company. I'm sure there are great examples in small companies because sometimes if one man just gets behind it, or the owner's interested, then, then it happens. Um, large companies, it's very, it's very different dynamic, really. Uh, again, if the person at the top puts a lot of uh, emphasis on it, um, then it, it will it will grow exponentially. That's that 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 that's for sure. But if it's it's not seen as a particular priority, maybe it won't. But uh, I, I think I think both both can be equally successful, no doubt about that. And the small companies aren't going to have their own staff. They're going to have to employ consultant ecologists and contractors. No doubt, but there's plenty of those around, and frankly, they're not all that expensive. Lovely. Uh, John Gall asked, uh, there have been several mentions of acidic and calcareous soil rock types so far. Do these very high or very low conditions ever impact upon restoration, i.e. does restoration ever fail due to the pH level? You know, in my experience, it doesn't fail due to pH levels, and hopefully the Mansetta uh, thing um, you know, answered answered that. Um, you can have problems with water on on site and standing water, uh, which is going to need addressing. Extremely acidic water by you know by liming, etc. To my mind, what what will make restoration fail more likely is heavy clay soils are difficult to uh, to, to to get things to, to to grow in. I think they, they would be my. Um, They'd be the Sheffield United at the moment of the of the Premier League um, for uh, for wanting to uh, to plant into that. And I'll say it again: heavily compacted ground. Uh, if the, there are a lot of planting of conifers on the on the Bunter sandstone in the in the Midlands, and a lot of that's on. You see examples on heavily compacted ground, and the trees are just just struggling. To get up through it you know it, it was it was run over with heavy equipment while it was wet and and the roots just can't get in there so heavily compacted ground you know put a rip tractor through it loosen it with an excavator four individual holes you know for, for, for the trees but over compaction and clay are much bigger problems than acidity or alkalinity i'd say lisa gamble asked about the heather brashwood um where can it be gathered where it doesn't then cause damage from the source i guess do you need to have a license to cut it you almost certainly will because a lot of um uh, heather will be on uh, nature reserves and uh some on private land obviously but uh, yeah you'll need need their permission but you know there's no um there shouldn't be a problem in this. I mean, if you think about Heather, Heather Moreland, for instance, on, on the high ground, you know, it used to be burnt. It's either burnt for grouse shooting or um, to encourage young growth, or it's cut. Um, and the, the, a lot of people are saying it should be always cut now and burning's you know, not, not acceptable. So that Heather Moreland got cut and the brash removed and it flourished again. So there's no reason why Heathland you can't you can't cut it. You're not cutting you, the 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 cutters are set pretty high when you take this brash off, and you would do it at the right time of year, just before the seed was about to fall. Heather seed is absolutely microscopic. You know, you you, you can't see it, but it but it but it's in there. But yeah, you're going to need permission, and you're going to need to explain why you want to do it. Um, but and and then going to see how much you I mean if you can only get 500 square meters you you might have to dilute that a lot and put it over 2,000 you know meters of ground or something like that. Um, Andy Duncan asked how much mineral sterilization on the upper levels and therefore massive knock-on effect on all lower faces to achieve rollover features and what if any of the upper levels have already been worked to their maximum lateral extent and with only five to seven meter benches? That's that. That's that's a very good question um, because clearly, you know, we're, we're quarrymen. We've got our hard-fought areas, and 
in many ways, we're not doing anyone any favors by not trying to get, take the maximum volume out because if we don't, we'll have to start a new quarry somewhere else. Um, to, to answer the question, the in the case of uh, Balladen or Dean or, 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 or Longcliffe, or any of those ones I've been associated with, the rollover is determined by planning. So uh, you, you've lost that reserve because that that is your planning limit, and that's the. the and, you know, and this is where the landscape architect's visual interpretation from a distance comes in, because they will determine which benches need rollovers to limit the visual impact from footpaths and uh, features like that. So you typically go down one or two benches, so 15 or 30 meters, and it would stand at about one in one o o o o overall. To my mind, you then, the next bench um, probably needs to be more than seven meters, maybe 10 or something like that, so you can get a reasonable you know, amount of uh, material on it. But as I said, Last time at Longcliffe, the next bench down, we just took it down at an angle of about 30 degrees from the uh, uh, vertical and, and pressed material into the, into the cracks, if you like. So we didn't really lose much at all there. And then I think as you go down, when you're in the bowels of the quarry, you are starting to see, you know, close to vertical, you know, faces and, uh, and, 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 and not so much retroactivity restoration activity on the benches. So that, that's how you, you sort of limit it. Um, should we consider mixing our native species of trees with their European variants as well in response to global warming and establishing greater resilience for woodlands in the long term? Well, yes, yeah, another good question. Uh, I mean, obviously everything is, uh, is moving north at uh, a rate of, you know, several miles per year, be it, you know, cod or butterflies or, or all sorts of things. So, um, that sort of already happened in a way because a lot of um, trees, which you might think are native, like the sweet chestnut, were brought in by the by the Romans. Um, so that that sort of things uh, un, un, underway. Obviously, you know, ash. You'd be foolish to plant too much ash now, um, and uh, and you know, and, and until we get proven disease disease resistant uh, strains, and then of course. In places like the Peak Park and the North York's uh, Park, sycamore is sort of established as part of the landscape. So, so, although it's not a native species, in terms of landscape, rather than ecology terms, there is some sort of requirement for it. But overall, I would I would be sticking to the to the native species really. Um, and as I said, this big argument about what what is, but I mean. You, people would argue that beach is only native to the southwest. Okay, so you know that that can that can move north from the sweet chestnut I alluded to. But no, stick to the go back to that list of native species and stick to that for the time being, please. Okay, and then a question from Siobhan Hall, who makes the makes the comment about management being more complicated in the longer term who manages the land and at what cost so for example after the planned aftercare period or once the land is returned to a landowner or sold the quarry operator cannot guarantee all of the effort and cost they put in during the operation won't be lost in a couple of years with lack of management yeah that well that's sadly true um that's sadly true i mean you can put in a, a sort of robust scheme that hopefully survives that. So for instance, when I talked about grazing, which is a you know, very good technique because it's it, it cheap and it's productive and uh, uh, you, you get the economic benefit of, 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 of the sheep and, and most, you know, a farmer or a landowner would want to continue that. Um, similarly with, um, you know, with trees, if there's plenty of oak in there long-term or, or beech or ash, they don't they want to take those trees to maturity and and manage them. So I think you try and put in a, a, a robust scheme, which is, you know, it's got some economic favor over the, uh, uh, you know, over the years after the quarry. But at the end of the day, um, 
unless you hand it up over with some sort of binding agreement, it is in danger of being lost. I think less so in quarries because, frankly, you know, quarry benches and you know, they're, 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 in, unless they're in right for brownfield develop the development, they're probably not going to be disturbed. And then, of course, you know, we talk about the Heathland a lot. That that's going to be triple SI and won't, will be protected in in that way. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, can I say you were well done to Andy? He's, uh, he's done very well. It's particularly interesting to see the results of some of the things we were involved with both at, uh, at Mansetta and to a lesser extent uh, restoration of the open cast coal works at, at Clee Hill. Uh, it really is good. Uh, one point I was somebody was asking about acidity on restoration. I remember long before I joined ARC when I was working for uh, the other side of the Shields family at Breeden, we were doing restoration of open cast coal sites all over the East Midlands area. There's one particular site on the Chesterfield Road from the M1, and it was just an open, it was just a, an old coal uh, shale heap, red, red shale, you know, the red burnt shale, no soil on it at all. We were working for the open cast executive at the time, and all we did there was put, I think, two tons to the acre of, of limestone and a half a ton an acre of, um, of, of, of slag. And we see that initially with the Italian ryegrass, and then we after a year, we undersaw, underseeded it with a, a more permanent crop. And you can drive past that site now. You wouldn't even know it's there on the right hand side driving towards Chesterfield. And, it, and after a few years, there was some sort of soils had come from somewhere, probably the dust from Chesterfield. I don't know. Uh, but you, that's all it was. Red shale uh, with some limestone on it and some slag and a, a pioneer crop of ryegrass. And that's that's there now. And it's proof of the fact you, you can anything will grow even on acid soils. Yeah. Well, I, I won't comment, Mike. You've, you've echoed my points. It's a very germane, good example. In the old days, and uh, Mr. Hardy will remember, at a quarry called Nantma, we used to spray sewage sludge everywhere to encourage uh, growth. We used to get some wonderful tomato crops out of it, but apart from that, I'm not sure whether that's the sort of thing that would still be encouraged. Well, I think uh, if, um, as I said at the beginning, if land is grade one, grade two agricultural land, and uh, you're thinking of the same quarry I am, uh, with Dave Diaf uh, back in the day, I think. Um, excellent, another excellent uh, quarry manager. Um, I, I, I don't see a problem with, uh, with, with that. I mean, I mean, sewage slope's got to, got to go somewhere. Um, okay, you can only put so much on because there, there's heavy metal content to be, uh, to be, to be talked about, but the, with the high-grade agricultural land, I, I think it's got to go back to high-grade agricultural land, but let's make the whole landscape a bit more interesting. I think to, you know, to put some copses in with it and more hedgerows and more interesting hedgerows, uh, that, that, that needs doing. But um, I, I, I don't actually see a problem with, uh, with sewage slope. I certainly wouldn't be putting it on the sort of restoration I've been talking about today. I mean, that would destroy yeah. But that was that was old quarry faces, old quarry batters that we sprayed a lot of sewage sludge on to try and encourage growth. And uh, so it worked to an extent, but you're almost advocating that the more uh, natural materials you leave behind rather than introducing something off a sewage farm uh, is probably better. Yeah. 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 I've yeah. got another little anecdote that uh, I hope we'll find people in fire instruction many years ago when we tried to put a 75 million ton extension on Watley Quarry. And a camera crew from BBC Southwest came and interviewed me as I think it was operations director of ARC Southern or something at the time. And I asked, like, you're taught to do what questions they were going to ask. And they said, Well, we just want to know how many people work here and how much you take out by rail to save the local roads, etc., etc., etc. And when the camera started, a bit of fox fur stuck up my nose, the guy said, Mr. Last, how can you possibly excuse this horrible scar on the landscape? Everybody can see you behind, see from behind you, yeah? as we were stood by the viewing point. And all I did was smile and come up with the phrase, today's quarry is, today's quarries are the nature reserves of tomorrow. And I repeated that so many more times and it seemed to register with an awful lot of people. And uh, everything you've said today just uh, enhances that. And uh, cool. I think we have a lot to be proud of, a lot to be still done and could be done better, but um, we've not made a bad start to things. You've always been a man ahead of your time, Derek. Yeah, absolutely.